Welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, where today we'll be interviewing Worshipful Brother Nathan Davis, the Grand Chaplain-Elect of the Grand Lodge of New Brunswick. Ladies and gentlemen, brethren all, welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, a casual conversation around Freemasonry. First, it's important to note that our thoughts and opinions are our own and do not reflect those of our Grand Lodge or respective craft or concordant bodies. Please connect with us and ask questions via our website at theworkingtoolspodcast.com. Thank you for joining us here on the Working Tools Podcast. My name is Matthew Apple, and I'm a Mason here in the great state of Washington, along with very worshipful brother David Colbeth. And we also have with us our other usual two hosts, uh, worshipful brother Jared Dunham and Stephen Chung from the Grand Lodge of British Columbia in Yukon. And as I said earlier, we have with us soon to be, but not quite yet, very worshipful brother, uh, Nathan Davis, who is the Grand Chaplain-Elect of the Grand Lodge of New Brunswick. Uh, worshipful brother N Davis, thank you very much for joining us here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So uh, as as David has said earlier, we, we like to uh, get a little background of the people we interview in, for an episode. So uh, what what drew you to Masonry? How did you end up being work, being involved with the with the grant with the lodge and with Grand Lodge? I um, I took a different route than most Masons, traditional Masons take, I think. I didn't know anything about it didn't hear about it, didn't really know what it was. And a person with whom I'd worked on a couple of different projects said, you should look at becoming a Mason. Now I know theoretically I should have asked first, but um, me being wanting to do things differently right from the start, I thought, okay, I'll go with that and see what happened. So I, um, I got interviewed and obviously accepted. And then every role I've had in my lodge so far, uh, I've been asked to do by the brothers. I don't really look for Masonic uh, progression as such in the traditional form. I'm, people ask me to do things, and I think they're interesting, so I take them on, and I do them to my best of my ability. I became a Mason in 2015, and I was raised in 2016, and I've served as Master of the Lodge for the last two years. And I think that if you could be a Master of Lodge during the COVID pandemic, I think you've cut your teeth and then some. And actually, as my new title will be also soon to be past master, uh, the brethren of my lodge have decided that it's time for me to take a break. And so in January, I'll be a past master, which is kind of, I didn't ask for that either. But in hindsight, you know, it's, it is nice that they recognize how much work I've put into the last two years and also that I'm deserving of a bit of a break. So in the United States, we, we consider a, a guy a past master immediately after taking his obligation. Is that a little different in Canada? You have to be out of the office? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you're not a past master until after your term is over. And they give you that little gavel that doesn't make much noise because <laughs> it's reflective of how much noise you should make. <laughs> I think that's just the one they gave used to you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they, so, they have them. Everybody around BC's got them. <laughs> so the other uh, component of this journey that I've been on so far is the Grand Lodge, um, Grand Lodge business, and I was, you know, as a new Mason, and even as someone who's now done two years in the chair in the East, I still had this vision of prerequisites of being a Grand Lodge officer. And it's not about past offices you've held. It's not about uh, delivering podcasts all over the world or visiting lodges all over the world. There are two primary requirements that you have to have in order to be a Grand Lodge officer. You got to be old and you either have to have really white or at least gray hair or no hair or some combination thereof. And when I looked at myself, uh, I never, I mean, it's something that I thought down the road, you know, five more, 10 more years. And I got a call from uh, a person who was running to be the grand master. And he said, would you be my grand chaplain? And I said, well, um, who are you? First of all, so I didn't know him. I, I never, I met the man once at my installation as master. That's the only time I ever met him. 
and I didn't know who he was at the time. And um, I told him, I said, you know, I'm Jewish, right? And he said, well, yeah. And he said, uh, and I said, you know, it's, I'm going to be doing things a little differently than my predecessors. No idea what those things are yet, but I, I anticipate uh, doing a little more than what the Constitution says we do, which is offer opening closing prayers at Grand Lodge. I said, surely you can't expect someone like me to just say six sentences a year. Surely that cannot be true. And so I reached out to the Grand Lodge, uh, the Grand Chaplain of Quebec, who is an ordained rabbi. So we have a little bit of a connection there. And he offered me some ideas on how I can evolve the role into being more relevant in the greater scheme of the Grand Lodge and in our society, in our communities as well. Are you able to, to provide some of that insight? Is there anything particular that you're hoping to do that you can talk about? Or is that all what you want it to be more of a surprise? Uh, no, I, I, when people ask me, you know, in the, I can't speak for the, your jurisdictions. Uh, there is a bit of a funny story about the Grand Chaplaincy in New Brunswick. It is, according to the Constitution, an electable role, not appointed. Now, in the history of the Grand Lodge in New Brunswick, there has never been a contested office for this thing. You know, you don't have six people wanting to be the Grand Chaplain of any Grand Lodge ever. Not that I'm aware of anyway. Um, and this year being the second part two of COVID, uh, everything's going to be done a little differently. And someone else uh, ran for the role as well. So it's the first time a Jewish person has run for the role. First time it's actually been contested in the history of Grand Lodge in New Brunswick. Um, and the funny thing is that the incoming you know, the person that had asked me to be the grand chaplain, he didn't even know it was elected because it's understood that there's only one person that's ever asked. So it's there's by definition. And all of a sudden you have to have an election for the grand chaplain in New Brunswick. Really? <laughs> As it turns out, I was successful in that venture. And so my ideas for the role are to become more, bring masonry to the forefront and make it public. And people are going to squawk. People are going to be uncomfortable about that. But we've been very good at keeping ourselves secret to the point where many lodges are suffering from membership around here. And a lot of people don't understand and don't know what, masonry is and if i get the opportunity to wear my regalia in public with, with permission and dispensation uh you know at, at formal functions uh community functions uh i'll ask permission and this is what i'm going to do and this is why if people see the aprons and the collars and the gaunt and the gauntlets maybe someone will ask a question you know what is that guy and why is he wearing all that stuff and that's the first question that tells me that they're interested. We can have a conversation about those things. The other thing I want to do is become more heavily involved in pastoral care. And this is a plan that I wanted to do long before my experience with my junior warden, uh, or some brother Cody. And this is actually a game plan long before that. But now that I've been through that experience, it actually increases the urgency and the need for that because, what I've been dismayed to hear is that um, families don't often to know, don't often know what to do with the stuff when their family member who's Mason passes away. If he's been around for 40 years, the odds are he's got some stuff. And it's important that families understand, and this is where being in pastoral care team comes into play, that if you know there's a brother who's in palliative care, you can tell the family, look, this is, this is, I'm the grand chaplain of Grand Lodge in Brunswick. The person in the hospital is a Mason. And here are some things that you should be aware of what happens when he does pass. And that can happen. And you can choose to use all of them or none of them at your pleasure and at his pleasure. But we want to make sure you know what's out there for you so that you have support going through this very difficult uh, time. And I think, I think that's going to help families that don't know what to do. And especially, you know, it's good to know that you've got someone who knows what to do, knows how to do it, and knows how to get the job done. And so in that context, under the office of the Grand Chaplain, I can offer that service in addition to providing uh, spiritual care and, um, you know, just a chance to talk to a Masonic brother 
uh, in in their circumstance in hospital or in palliative care or nursing homes, wherever they are. Because, you know, you don't have a lot of visitors sometimes, especially if you're in a long-term care seniors facility. And sometimes it's nice to see someone who's wearing a square and compass come in and talk to you as a brother and might provide some comfort to that Mason who needs it. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, to pretty uh, two pretty cool ideas to to try and achieve as uh, and do something different. I like that. I uh, I like the idea of trying to do something different that way. Um, you know, they say that we're the sum of our experiences, and uh, now you said that you were raised in 2016, and you've been the worshipful master through COVID. So that means 2019. That's three years. Um, three years from being raised a Master Mason to being the Worshipful Master of the Lodge. How did that journey come about to be so quick? And, and uh, um, you know, tell us about your journey. Well, we all start off as stewards, right? You got to sit in the stewards chair. It's just a natural. Everybody starts there. I don't know anyone else who's, I have never been to any lodge anywhere. Now I've visited quite a few of them. Uh, where everybody starts as a steward. You got to sit there and just learn the role, L- learn to observe and observe to learn. And once I did that, and I did those duties as well, but I really paid attention to what people are saying. And then they asked me to, I say they, the brothers in my lodge, obviously, asked me to deliver some educational lectures on some historical parts of our lodge. We celebrate 220 years of history next year. So there is a significant amount of history in that lodge. And every year in June, we have what's called a founder's night where we uh, do a little ritual at the burial ground where founders from 219 years ago are buried. And I deliver a lecture about, you know, where we met, what was discussed, some of the more flamboyant characters and masons that our lodge has had and some of the more interesting circumstances of our lodge. And they saw that I'm willing to do the work in memory and I'm, I'm a competent, if not good, public speaker. And, you know, all all brothers in lodges are equals, but some have different skill sets. Some are good at organizing and planning events, public speaking, not their forte necessarily, whereas uh, I do believe in memorizing the ritual as much as I can and performing it to the best of my abilities. And I think that's why uh, I did a progression to... Uh, from steward to senior deacon to senior warden to master in that short of a time because they saw something in me that they liked, obviously, otherwise they wouldn't have asked me. And when I became master in 2020, I had a plan. And then God laughed at them and said, here's COVID. Let's see what we do with your plans now. And uh, a lot of those plans, unfortunately, weren't able to be executed and that's no fault of my own it's because of circumstance and people not being able to meet and public health and government restrictions so i feel bad that my plans didn't meet all of the things i wanted to do but also it allowed me to really do things differently and one of the there were two things that i was able to do uh, one of which has never been done before in any lodge that i'm aware of i did this in may may of no sorry in april of this year i did a masonic engagement service uh brother uh in our lodge came up to me said you know before i came to the craft i was kind of lost i didn't life didn't really have direction and everything got turned around in my life and gave me some good focus and i met someone i want to spend the rest of my life with and i'd like you to do a masonic engagement service and Brother Appel, I see your look of confusion on your face. You say, that's good. What does that mean? And that's what I asked him. I said, well, what do you want? He said, well, I want you to, to organize this event for us and see if you could do some ritual work and in- incorporate some of the Masonic messages into the service without giving away the secrets. Yeah. And uh, Worship Brother Chung, you're looking at me too. And I, I said, well, I'll look into it. And I asked around. I asked people who've been doing it for 30, 40 years. There is a Masonic wedding service, but there is no such thing anywhere that I've come across where it's a Masonic engagement service. So I sat down about three months ahead of time and organized the event, and I wrote a five to six page ritual, including floor movement and script for 
uh, six different officers and the uh, engaged couple to be done in the lodge room itself with uh, visitors in, in attendance. That wasn't a tiled lodge. Uh, it was just a service that happened to be in the lodge. And I permit, obviously I asked permission to do this and I had it. And it was, uh, it was the first event that we'd done as a lodge um, for public uh, since COVID began. It was a, and the fact it was the first time it's ever been done was a uh, really incredible experience. You, you say that there's a, a Masonic wedding service. Matt, have you ever heard of that? I've never heard of that in our jurisdiction. I've heard of that. I, I never, yeah, de I'm definitely not in our jurisdiction. I don't think there is one, but I've heard of it existing in, in other, in other places. Yeah. And I don't know what that means. I don't, I've never seen it myself, uh, but I know that other jurisdictions do it and I suspect I'll probably be doing one in June. So I better find out who, who does them and where are they? Cause I'll need, I'd rather not reinvent the wheel guess, twice if I could avoid I guess it. The idea it brings new meaning to the idea of being married to the craft. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. So those those are some of the things that I've done, uh, notwithstanding the uh, the the long uh, process I began with. Um, the long journey I began with uh, my worship brother, Cody, who just passed in early September. Um, and that was a whole other, that was a whole other experience that we're going to talk about um, now that he has passed. And I have had time to uh, go through my own grieving process through that um, because I was heavily involved. And because of that, um, it was like losing a family member to me. I don't know what family person it would be, probably uncle or maybe uh, stepfather or something. I don't know, but um, it was a grieving process. And I, I was quite pleased um, that the uh, funeral service, they actually recorded at my request, they recorded the Masonic service for him and the part afterwards where I read the message to the assembled brother and after the Masonic memorial service we did. And that was, uh, that was really special actually. Um, and I won't, uh, I won't be afraid in that either anytime soon. I don't think. So you said that you were kind of introduced to masonry. Was that by somebody that you had worked? I apologize. Was it somebody you worked with or someone you knew and how, how did they, how did they know you to be a good person? I mean, like you said, in theory, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to ask, but I, I, I think we should do it. We did a show, a series on myths in the past, but I think it's a little bit of a myth and a, a little bit of a misnomer these days that we shouldn't have to wait for a guy to ask us to be a Mason or, you know, I guess it's okay to say, Hey, what's that about? And we've talked about it before in the show saying, Hey, uh, I think it's okay to ask a guy or, Hey, I thought about masonry or whatever, but I think we should be a little more, even more, a little more bold about talking to a person about somebody that we think would be a good man or a good candidate for masonry. I, I had been involved um, with this person on uh, several different projects, and he and I are both ex-military, so we share that uh, common bond as well. Uh, he being an officer, me being non-commissioned, but we both, he did 32 years, I think, and I did 20. Um, and we shared that bond, and he, he just saw something in me um, that... Uh, I think it was a combination of different qualities that he saw. I think he knows that I like to learn and that's a big component, obviously, of Mason. You're always trying to learn something new or learn about something new. Uh, obviously with 20 years in the, in the leader, in the military, you do pick up some leadership abilities along the way somewhere. You almost have to, by definition, they're forced upon you sometimes. Also, he knows um, that I am goal oriented. So when I set a goal, I generally get it done or I really work hard at getting it done. And all those things combined, I mean, not that everybody has to have done military service and not everybody has to be super organized or even necessarily that you're, uh, have a love of learning. I mean, fundamentally, we all have to be decent human beings, really. We have to believe in a supreme uh, being the supreme architect the universe, creator of the universe, whatever terminology you choose to use, and you have to be of good moral character. It's in our application form, and it's reviewed by the investigating committees. But if you have someone who has 
above the minimum requirements to be a Mason, uh, those people should be uh, should be let know of the unique opportunities that Masonry presents that you won't get anywhere else. And uh, Brother Chung and I talked about, or so Brother Chung and I talked about it before, where it's different than other public service groups because you know if you look at a club like Rotary or you look at um, Lions, I don't think you'd find them in the same capacity where if you had a person in their group that was dying of a uh, disease in palliative care that you would ask someone to go see them every day. I, I mean, maybe they do. I don't, I don't, I'm not a part of either of those groups. That's possible, but I don't think, I don't think you would have the obligation to do that. Whereas an organization kind of do. <laughs> It's interesting. I, I was part of the, I still am a part of the VFW and um, I, I didn't step backwards fast enough. So I'm currently the president of my Lions Club. You, interesting you mentioned that. And and yes, there's different aspects of both of those organizations that I found intriguing. But for me, I found that Masonry kind of brought them together. I had that fraternalism and that camaraderie from the VFW in Masonry and also that public service and giving back feature, if you will, in not only to myself, but also to my brothers and to the potential to the community that I get from Lions Club. I still am life members of both organizations, VFW and Lions, but I find that Freemasonry provides kind of the culmination and mixture of those two together, which is satisfying to me. I, I, I don't know. You know, there was a, I'd have to bring up the brochure. There was a brochure that says, if you're looking for, uh, networking, you should probably go to Rotary. If you're looking for community service, you should go to Lions Club. If you're looking for camaraderie or whatever, social time, you should go to the Eagles Club or whatever. Like, you know, Masonry is not, I think is kind of the title of the of the brochure. And it's, it was interesting <laughs> to think about those things. And, and in some respects, it's all of those. You don't, it's not expected or assumed. You don't join that to be that or to get those things, but it kind of comes once you get to know each other and, uh, understand who you are and what the what, what your lodge is about and what the guys are about. But I also, I also think here's the other component of this. That is um, it. It's kind of regrettable in the sense that we get a candidate through the, and I say, we, the tradition is, you get a candidate in the door, they get the investigating committee, they get the hoodwink experience, they get the whole nine yards, they get their master mason. And then what? I mean, theoretically, we should have mentors in every lodge and they should be hand holding someone saying, okay, this is your, these are your progression, the natural line of progression. Now, obviously, I've skipped a few steps. And that's you mean that's thing. not done at every other lodge out there? Theoretically. <laughs> But the other problem is that they, even when you, let's say that you're all keen and excited like I was, and I saw the opportunities for growth, and I saw how much I could learn, and I gravitated towards those opportunities every time someone said, well, hey, you've done that well, maybe you should look at this, maybe you should do that. And I embraced all those opportunities and the learning opportunities, um, but once you... Once you've gone through some chairs, then you need a higher level of mentorship. You know, once you get into your warden's chairs, once you get your first year as master where you're trying to figure out where your elbow is and where your held head is and make sure they don't get mixed up on occasion. Once you get through that process, then you need someone else to say, okay, now that you've cut your teeth in the chair for a couple of years, you've gone through the offices and lodge. Uh, either concordant bodies or Grand Lodge is a conversation that should be happening because we we want to, I would think that after 10 years in the craft and Warshall Brother talked about it, Warshall Brother Cody talked about it in his message that, um, you know, he wanted to do more, but time caught up with him where he got to a point in his health where he couldn't do the things he wanted he really actually wanted to do. He wanted to move up into Grand Lodge and he never took those opportunities and they were never presented to him for whatever reason. So he said he was working a lot during his 
younger years and then life sort of caught up with them. And I would hope that's one of the things that I'm going to work on with new masters as they come through and even new can even new candidates you know these these are your large opportunities after you get through those come back to me and we'll talk about other opportunities that exist because there's concordant body work that you can learn so much more about masonry because you think that becoming a master mason is all that and then some and it is it is the it is the is the highest level of mason you can be in a lodge but there's so many other learning opportunities you could do. I was a member of Scottish Rite, and I got my 32nd degree also in the last three years uh, before COVID. Um, and I enjoyed every minute of those rituals and every minute of those explanatories. Long days, yes, they were, but they were enjoyable days. And you know, I there's there's a there's a disconnect between you get raised, but then no one sort of gives you a point aside from lodge work and says, yeah, well, now you've been Stuart. Now you've been junior deacon, now senior deacon and the wardens and the rest. Um, but it, it's important that people understand that getting to master Mason is incredibly important. You can't have any fun until you become a master Mason. After you become a master Mason, then the real work begins and the real growth can happen where you're giving back to the lodge. And that's the opportunity that I took and I ran with, and I'm still enjoying it, still running with it. And as past master, I plan to be uh, still very enlarged with my lodge. I'm going to do, still do the work and still contribute. And I'm not going to be a past master that just uh, walks away from everything just because I've got title grand master. I suppose grand chapel elect means I really can't walk away from anything anymore, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> And and with that, I think we're about running out of time. And it's a it's a good lesson in in life as well as in masonry. If you're uh, was it supposedly the story is that I just heard this on another podcast, so who knows if it's true or not? But uh, Abraham Lincoln, before he was shot, like while he was sitting in the booth at the theater, uh, said to his wife, "You know, I've always wanted to see Jerusalem," and he he never got to do it because you know who knows what's coming next. So if there's something out there that you want to do for your own improvement or for the society around you or or on some level, just to have fun. Um, we, you know, you've got to get out there and do it. You can't just uh, fritter your life away on, on zoom calls with, with crazy people and, and uh, making podcasts and such. But, uh, but on a serious note, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Worship brother Nathan for, for coming onto the show. And it's a, uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you very and, much for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to another conversation or two with you here in the future. And on behalf of uh, Worship Brothers Jared and Stephen and myself and, and uh, David Colbeth, we uh, want to thank you all for listening and hope to see you again soon on the Working Tools podcast. Mm -hmm.